So I will be chairing the first session of the day called the State of the Working Groups. As mentioned, they'll dive deeper into various activities that are happening behind the scenes and pretty very critical work that are uh, active. So just for the speakers, there are 15 minutes and uh, five minute Q&A. Um, no pressure. <laughs> And um, hopefully, we'll get some nice discussions involved as well. So first will be by Holger and Orit about standards and technology working group. So please. OK. Is that on already? You hear me? Yeah. OK. So we try to hurry up 15 minutes. Uh, once we have the slides up, so I can start talking already. So uh, it's my pleasure to give you a quick overview of what we have been achieving in, last, or in the first year of our existence. So we really started operation in September last year. And um, I will start to talk, giving you a quick overview of who we are and what we are doing, and then uh, give you some examples of benchmarking studies that are already uh, uh, finished. And then Orit uh, will take over and give you some more case examples and an outlook of, we are planning, of what we are planning to do in the future. So this is who we are. So at the moment, we are uh, 18 members spread around uh, different institutions all over the globe. But I think for me, the most important point is that we are spread around expertise. So we have uh, basically all core expertise present that, are, that is uh, relevant for key research area within the human cell letters projects, spanning from uh, spatial transcriptomics, proteomics, uh, uh, over epi epigenomics to single cell RNA sequencing, obviously, and for me, one of the most important parts, uh, the sampling. Um, the mission of the group is basically to define uh, standards and guidelines uh, for the human cell letters community, and we do so by um, by, uh, by scouting and scaling emergent techniques, but also by benchmarking existing techniques. And the second part of my talk is about that. Um, okay, I will, give you, I will start giving you uh, two examples on how benchmarking led us to uh, crucial insights and how uh, techniques are performing. So these are these papers that were already mentioned by Aviv. So it's a uh, work led by Joshua Levin at the Broad and one work that came out from our lab in Barcelona where we were benchmarking um, different single cell and single nucleus RNA sequencing methods. And both techniques had, or uh, both projects had like kind of as uh, complementary designs, but as already mentioned, leading to uh, consistent answers, I would say. Uh, in our work, we were um, designing like a multi-center approach. We were, where we were pro uh, preparing a cryopreserved uh, reference sample, which was very complex, consisting of mouse colon cells and human peripheral blood cells. We were sending this sample out uh, to different labs all over the world. Those labs were performing a total of 14 different single cell RNA sequencing methods. The data was sent back to us middle of last year. And then we run all the data sets through a unique pipeline uh, for demultiplexing, mapping, and, and quantification. And I will not go too much into the details because it's now published in BioArchive just to highlight a few points. So in our work, we were stratifying the, the reference sample later by cell types. So we did not um, only split samples by species, so per peripheral blood mononuclear cells or colon, but we were splitting it further down by cell types and then performing a cell type specific analysis. Um, because we knew before that methods are performing, uh, some are better for larger cells with high RNA content uh, compared to smaller cells with a low RNA content. Um, so here, some examples highlighted. So these are examples for human blood cell types, uh, human cell types, including also hex cells, so larger cells with high RNA content. And you see the different performance of the methods. I don't want to pick any here. So the, we, we, we assessed the, 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 um, the quality of the data sets with uh, standard measures in, in the first place. And later, we went deeper into, uh, into testing how well those methods perform in the, in the framework of, of cell atlas projects. Um, Maybe some, some examples, from what I, uh, highlighting some examples as we are here in Japan, and performance of techniques. So here uh, we display the number of detected genes on downsampled data sets. Uh, and um, there were techniques that were performing uh, very well, like QuadSeq2, which was run here at the, uh, at the Rikin in Japan, but followed already by, by, uh, by CellSeq2, but also SmartSeq2 here in Ping, or 10x Genomics, were always ranging in the, in the top range of, of, of performance. <laughs> Um, so we were running those methods through uh, more, more intense analysis, like correlation analysis, marker identification, number of totally detected genes, while accumulating gene counts across multiple cells. And you can quickly see there are large difference between the, the different methods. Again, here in brown, I think we have 10x. 
in, in yellow, we have QuartSeq. Uh, this is CellSeq2, SmartSeq. Um, so the, def, uh, the, the best performing techniques were able to really detect a higher number of uh, marker genes for those respective cell types, while other techniques failed uh, to do so, at least to, to a higher expression level. This is everything plotted in two dimensions. So these are T's and E's, on, again, on downsampled data sets, uh, where you can appreciate that the well-performing techniques nicely separate cell types into different clusters, while other techniques are mixing um, cell types within cluster and giving you a, a lower resolution uh, to deconvolute your data set into a specific uh, subpopulations. Uh, finally, we were integrating all data sets together in a, in a joint count matrix. So this is displayed here. Uh, within this uh, joint count matrix, we were still able to separate cell types. So these are uh, um, cell types um, color coded uh, and, and separated within separate clusters. Um, however, within, so if we zoom within uh, specific clusters and cell types, we've seen that uh, specific methods still occupy specific niches in those clusters and we're not mixing well with other methods and this might be, um, it's, this might have an implication of future study designs where uh, large consortia work is uh, integrating uh, data sets from different, from different methods. So this was our work and this was sent back to back with uh, Joshua's work where uh, they did not, um, use, uh, well, they, um, uh, they did not, it um, was not a multi-center approach, but a one-center approach. In this case, all the libraries were sampled and were prepared in parallel. Um, there were some overlapping, but also some new samples uh, involved, uh, some overlapping techniques and also new techniques like SQL or cyrna seq um, But as already mentioned, the conclusion was kind of similar. So here we have, uh, again, the number of detected genes displayed on downsampled data, so, but this is separately downsampled for plate-based methods and microfluidic-based methods. So this is not a fair comparison. You can only compare uh, microfluidics within each other and not to the plate-based methods. Um, but yeah, as a conclusion, uh, uh, similar, we have um, CellSeq and SmartSeq performing similarly. And in the microfluidic methods, we have 10x being better performing than the other methods, especially the version three, uh, detected a higher number of, of genes. Um, so this was reproducible uh, across, um, across replicates. Uh, and the second approach they used, uh, um, or they, they tested the power to identify cell, type, uh, cell types and cell populations uh, using the data set and a well, very well uh, curated and annotated a set of marker genes for specific cell populations. And again, 10x was performing well by identifying those cell populations consistently across replicates, uh, while other methods failed to identify uh, rather more, more challenging uh, cell types. OK, now I'd like to switch gears a little bit from uh, benchmarking of single cell RNA sequ sequencing methods to uh, benchmarking um, sampling effects. So in here, we were running two studies, one, of, one on, on solid tissues and one on on uh, like more simulating a biobanked uh, a, scenar a scenario where um, blood samples are biobanked. Uh, in the first study, led by the Sanger and EBI, um, the, the project uh, uh, sampled from three tissues, lung, esophagus, and spleen, and five different donors and across four time points. And here the, the samples were conserved across the time points at, at four degrees. So there were, uh, it was cold storage. And uh, surprisingly, maybe to all of us, uh, there was quite consistent uh, uh, data reproducibility, reproducibility across all time points with only uh, small changes observed after 72 hours. So here after 72 hours, uh, the spleen data set um, showed a little bit less mappability and also a, a slightly increase in mitochondrial content. But I think the overall the, the data was quite consistent over the time points. Uh, this was uh, also obvious when looking at the heterogeneity of the samples, so the composition was rather constant over the time points, so comparing here, uh, and there was more variability observed uh, across the donors. And the, the study concluded that cold storage gives you, gives you very good data, and uh, that the main variability in cell type composition is between donors and not between uh, time points. And this data is now uploaded to the DCP, I think there were 300,000 very good quality transcriptomes and where people can look at it. OK, uh, finally, I'd like to highlight uh, one study that we were doing in, in, a, in a framework of biobank samples. Uh, the, the problem with biobank samples is they get cryopreserved, but the time until 
<laughs> time until cryopreservation preservation is, is changing uh, between samples, between hospitals, when samples are transported, and so forth, so on and so forth. And we were simulating this by um, leaving blood samples on the bench at room temperature or storing them at four degrees for a certain amount of time before cryopreserving uh, cryo -pre them. And this is what we found. So this is what would be hypothesized before, hypothesized before that the sampling time, so the, the time a sample is left at room temperature before cryopreservation actually has a strong effect on the single cell transcriptomes. And this is what you can see here. So this is uh, zero hours for freshly cryopreserved. Uh, two hours still has a, almost no effect on the transcriptome, but then you see a gradient effect on the transcriptome uh, uh, with a, well, up, to, up to 48 hours. Uh, from, those, uh, signature, or from those profiles, we were um, extracting a signature that uh, was used later to, to identify um, affected cells. And we used the signature after identifying affected cells to correct those, uh, which might be a viable strategy for uh, retrospective uh, biobanked um, um, cohorts, but for future um, for future work, we highly recommend the storage at four degrees. So here you have four degree samples um, displayed in light blue compared to the room temperature stored samples in, in, dark, in, uh, in, in orange type. Uh, and so for future experimental designs, we, we highly recommend, at least for those that focus on single cell RNA seq as, uh, as readout, to store the samples at four degrees. And with this, I would hand over to Ort. <laughs> So in the last year uh, and a half, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, working on getting uh, systematic pipelines for uh, tissue uh, processing to work, both for uh, healthy tissue or normal tissue, and as well as disease tissue. Um, and we did that across uh, both live donors and organ donors, uh, which are very different type of samples. And we actually looked at different parameters. We um, looked at the collection. For fresh samples, we looked at the dissociation parameters, uh, such as enzymatic and mechanical dissociation. Um, and we, uh, for um, frozen samples, we actually looked again at the collection. Here we're uh, looking across resection, biopsies, and uh, uh, cell pellets for both, as well as fluids. Um, and for the frozen samples, we also looked at freezing uh, uh, methods such as OCT or immediately freezing the samples. We developed both uh, for the fresh tissue and for the, f for the f um, frozen tissue uh, toolboxes that are specific for um, dissociation or nuclei uh, lysis. We also developed specific computational pipelines that go along with those. So these pipelines were actually developed for single cell and single nucleus RNA sequencing. Um, and I'm going to show you some results and some projects that actually help us lay the foundation for developing these specific pipelines. Um, in the future, we're planning to also implement uh, methods for spatial profiling within these uh, processing uh, pipelines. Um, and we're hoping to show you some results for that in the future. So let me start by describing some of the projects that actually lay the foundation for these. So the first one is the Tumor Cell Atlas project. Um, and here we have several arms. So we have what have you mentioned before as the CZI START project. This is an international project where we're looking across five different tumor types, looking at single cell and single nucleus RNA sequencing methods again. And here we uh, plan to compare different methods using the same sample um, and also compare different, um, the different methods across different labs across the, the ocean. So I think that's a really interesting project and we have quite nice results from that as well. In addition, we also have the HTAP and HTAN projects, which are NCI uh, cancer moonshot funded projects. And here the idea is actually to generate cell atlases by profiling um, using mo uh, molecular methods to profile dissociated cells as well as um, cells within tissues and also combine them with uh, very exciting new computational analysis. So what helped us generate these specific pipelines? What are the lessons that we actually learned during this time? Well, for fresh tissue, 
we first learned how to optimize dissociation, which wasn't really that simple because each tissue is very different and you have to tailor the dissociation method to the specific tissue. So we optimized cell, cell viability, we optimized cell dissociation. So here you can see an example of uh, lung cancer tissue. We used three different processing protocols and within each processing protocol we get a different uh, composition of cell types. We also spend a lot of time optimizing nuclei preps, and here is what we call the before and after uh, screenshots. So the before is actually um, a result of, of two years where we tried to use nuclei processing, uh, and we really didn't succeed because the first protocol was meant to, or was shown to work in brain, but didn't work in other tissues. So after we actually got our toolbox for processing single nuclei, we could in four weeks get really nice results, and this is a neuroblastoma sample. We're also now comparing different methods on the same sample across different labs as part of the CZI start, and uh, we are trying to put all the data together, so we have different types of methods and different types, types of data modalities, so there are now uh, computational methods that can put all these different types of data together. And importantly, we're also gleaning new insights into biology, and for example, in Mario Silva's lab, where they processed glioma samples, they can now connect between um, the uh, different states in glioma and the genetic composition of the tumor, which is very exciting. Another study that uh, we're doing, and this is a co very, very tight collaboration with Kristen Ardley, who's my partner in crime for this, is now to look at normal tissues. So we look at, for each case, we look at three donors across eight tissues using the different uh, nuclei preps. In this case, we're looking at four nuclei preps. preps. Then we put in our, uh, we use our computational pipeline, which was designed specifically for that. So since these are nuclei, um, it accounts for introns, for empty drops, and we also have specific QCs that we use in this pipeline. And after that, we annotate the cell types. So here you can see the results for the eight different tissues. So we uh, initially look at the eight different tissues by themselves. And when we look at the basic QCs, such as the number of cells, the number of genes, uh, the percent mitochondrial and ribosomal reads, we see that while using the four buffers, they look pretty much similar. However, when we look at the cell types, and these are the basic cell types, we're not getting into very fine cell types, we see that buffer number four, for example, can predict uh, a larger number of cell types that we can find. So we think that for example, for these types of tissues that we looked at, it might be a better buffer to use. And here you can see the example for lung, for example, you can see most of the known uh, cell types. So we're not going into very fine detail yet. So then we can put all of this uh, data together. So we profiled over 300,000 nuclei across the eight different tissues. And we can see pretty much the expected cell types we see that there are cell types that are shared across tissues. For example, there are immune cells that you can see in different tissues, uh, while there are other cell types that you can see in only specific tissues. For example, the aonocyte you will see only in the lung. Um, and we're, uh, now that we have the data, we're doing deep computational analysis um, and looking at cross-tissue comparison, which is something that's very interesting for us. In addition, uh, we're also hoping to uh, profile additional samples or additional tumors, additional samples, meaning increasing the number of individuals. And at the end of the day, we're hoping to tie this to genetic analysis. So we're very, very uh, excited about this effort. Um, as the STWG group, one of our important missions is actually to disseminate our knowledge. So we use protocols IO for that. Uh, we put our all the protocols, uh, and we also really encourage the community to put their protocols on there. There are a lot of discussions between members, so people try this protocol and that protocol, and comment on it, and then improve upon protocols. So I think this is a, a really uh, nice way to um, communicate between everyone here. 
We also have what we call the uh, HTAP SWAT team. Um, it's not as uh, scary as it sounds, but the main idea here is actually to have people with a lot of experience with, for now, with single cell and single nucleus RNA sequencing go from a place that knows how to process these samples in, in a really uh, professional way so, and uh, go to places that really this is their first time tackling such pipelines or they're still struggling or don't know exactly how to fit this to their, uh, to their environment, to their hospital or to their research centers. Um, and the idea is that the SWAT team is composed of people who know how to process the samples, people who know the hospital layout and how to get samples quickly, as well as computational people. And they come and give talks. Um, and they also do a side-by-side -side comparison, doing actual work and then looking at some of the data together, which we found was very rewarding for both sides because each side learns quite a lot from the other. Uh, till now, we had three really successful uh, visits, one to St. Jude, one to uh, Boston Medical Center, and then another one to CHOP. So we're really, really uh, excited about this. So uh, what are our plans for the next year, the upcoming year? So first of all, we want to assess the performance and complementary of protocols and compare them across collection sites and processing groups. So we want to look both at single cell and single nucleus RNA sequencing. We also want to look at epigenomic organization. So for example, on single cell ATAC, we want to now put in the spatial methods as well. So we'll look at spatial resolved RNA and protein, which it's important to do both of these. And then we plan to partner with our kidney friends and use kidney as an example uh, for doing such uh, comparisons. And overall, we want to test the integrity, reproducibility, and predictive value uh, using these benchmarks. We're also really interested now, so Holger talked about the single cell and single nucleus RNA, or single cell um, comparison. So next, we want to do that across single cell atac seq and use the different methods across different labs. Uh, we would love to continue to evaluate the benchmark of spatial methods. So um, there's a really nice project going on, which is called SpaceTX, um, and we'll hopefully hear more results from them next time. And then uh, we think it's really important to continue to disseminate the knowledge uh, to the community uh, through um, protocols IO, and we're also inviting uh, people with new technologies to come and give talks at the STWG uh, group and so forth. So uh, last, I want to advertise our uh, breakout session, uh, which we're going to talk uh, more in depth about all the topics that we talked about in our talk today. And it's going to be on Friday, which is tomorrow, um, at 9 a.m. at room uh, A. And we have several members of the STWG uh, group, as well as Jimmy and Guo Zhi Guo. Uh, and we really welcome you to come there and join us. And that's it. Thank you, Ori and Holger. Um, I'll take really one quick question. We're seven minutes over time. So if there are any pressing questions that you guys have, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll get the next speaker in line. Questions? OK. Um, so Ori and Holger are here for the next day and a half. So please approach them and also join the uh, breakout sessions tomorrow. So thank you. Next, uh, we'll have Rahul Satija talking about the Common Coordinated Framework. I believe this is a very important topic in the Human Cell Atlas, so hopefully it'll be relevant. Now the speaker's missing. They're putting some makeup, I think. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Microphones. Right. Okay, there he is. Okay. Regular, uh, <laughs> just maybe a, a regular mic here. Uh, okay, well, thanks so much for, <laughs> for giving the chance to be here. 
Uh, I'm going to talk about um, our, our initial efforts to construct a common coordinate framework for the human body. And, and the goal here is um, you know, to move beyond not just constructing a, a human cell dictionary or a human cell census, uh, but of course to construct a, a human cell atlas uh, because uh, we're sequencing quite a number of cells, as you saw so beautifully from Aviv and Sarah and others. Uh, and what we really want to know now is, is where they are and where they came from. And you know, this is a problem that I've been interested in for about the last four or five years, and, and it started when I was a postdoc in Aviv's lab and moving to my own group, and, and we had sequenced a number of cells from the zebrafish embryo, uh, and we immediately wanted to understand where they were actually located and where they were came from, and so we designed a computational method to back map cells back to their, to their spatial location based on their gene expression. Uh, John Marioni at Embol EBI actually had the exact same idea, and we, we published a, a couple of papers uh, a few years ago and, and got really interested in this problem, realizing eventually that we were going to have to do this also in humans. And so we've been thinking about this problem of how to sort of spatially represent uh, the human body for a while. Uh, and now my lab leads uh, what's called a mapping center for the Human Biomolecular Atlas Project, or HubMap, which we'll tell you a little bit more about later today. Uh, and I do that with John and Aviv, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we're thinking about this problem of, of building a CCF. Uh, so what do we mean by a, by a common coordinate framework? Sort of what does that represent? And, and actually, there was a, a meeting of a, a couple of years ago uh, that was uh, hosted at the NIH, uh, also with CZI and NHCA, uh, sort of thinking about this problem. And, and they defined a, a CCF as a, a coordinate system that could uniquely and reproducibly define any location in the human body. And of course, that's, that's the primary goal that we have to achieve. Uh, we, we know that that coordinate system is going to be you know, defined to, or, or relative to one or probably many, many more origin points. And, and one of the really key challenges here, and I'll go into this in, in more detail, is that those origin points, of course, have to be robust to the incredible anatomical uh, and natural variation that exists across human beings. One of the other real challenges of the CCF is, is how you know, we have to model human variation and, and human spatial location across quite a large variety of scales. Uh, from the macro level, we're thinking about sort of the, you know, zooming out to the whole human body. Uh, you know, to the very, very fine cellular level where maybe you know, we'll of course have enormous, enormous variation but it may not be physiologically relevant to that sort of mesoscale, that transition point where we both have significant uh, uh, anatomical variability, but it's also quite physiologically relevant. And trying to have these atlases work over these multiple scales is one of our primary challenges. So I think this is a really hard and, and fascinating problem. To, to me, it's certainly much more difficult than, than clustering uh, single cell RNA-seq data. Uh, but actually, it's, it's worth remembering that, that this is not a new problem. People have been thinking about this for quite a while. So even you know, dating back to, to the 1960s, uh, there have been atlases of human tissues, including the brain. Uh, so this is, this is referred to as the Tolerica Tourneau Atlas, and, and it's basically a grid uh, that can be used for, for that was built by and, 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 and used for neurosurgery. And the idea is, is that this grid can be applied to any human brain sample, regardless of the, of the extensive anatomical variation, of course, that exists across people and their brains. And the reason that works is because the primary axes for these grids are defined based on a series of robust anatomical landmarks that are present uh, in all human beings. So for example, the, the major axis uh, falls along the line that's defined by the anterior and the posterior commissure, which falls along the mid-sagittal plane. And the idea is that for any brain that comes in, if you have a new data set uh, or a new CT scan or an MRI scan, as long as you can identify those same landmarks on that sample, you can then map that, uh, that specimen back onto this existing reference framework. And this has been an extraordinarily valuable tool uh, uh, in neuroscience for, for, for many, many years. I find it remarkable, actually, that this, this atlas was constructed based on two sections from a single 60-year-old individual. Uh, and despite that sort of initial selection, it's still been so useful. Now, of course, uh, as time has gone on, there's been great interest in, in moving beyond a reference that's constructed uh, simply based on a single person, and, and the, the International Consortium for Brain Mapping is, is an example where they're now taking hundreds uh, of, of individuals uh, and then trying to, to basically construct a reference from all of those people together. Actually, it's kind of interesting, one of the ways that they deal with the extensive anatomical variation when you have hundreds of people is to map all of those samples back first into the Tyler Reich framework, and that then enables you to sort of to, to assist in the registration process of merging people's scaffolds together. And so that general process, you know, there, there's sort of two really key, obviously, uh, components to this, and I think this will be true for HCA as well. The first is to have some sort of source of spatial data. So in, in these cases, they would be, for example, MRI or CT scans. But I think with the advent of technologies that we're seeing here, those could very easily expand to, extend to, for example, spatial transcriptomics data or slide seek data. Uh, but you need some sort of spatial data for a reference. 
And the second thing you need, of course, are these, these anatomical landmarks, these invariant features that are going to be present across individuals that are essential for this common part of the common coordinate framework. Uh, and those, those features can be you know, notated by hand, they can, be, they can be learned in an unsupervised way, I'll talk a little bit more about those options, but, we, but th those are really one of the most important aspects because they're gonna define the origin points for our coordinate systems. So what we've proposed to do for HubMap, and, and I think we'll do this individually for, for a variety of tissues, both for HubMap and ATA, uh, is to build these effectively relative or stereotaxic coordinate systems that start from spatial data that, that, that will be collected by, by data generators, uh, and then annotate landmarks on top of them uh, and, and use those to, to build anatomical scaffolds. And once we build those anatomical scaffolds, then we can build reference coordinate systems on top of that uh, that are robust across individuals. So, so this is a very sort of broad and, and, and generalized idea, but, but let me talk about what are some of the specific challenges that we anticipate facing here, and then I'll show you a little bit of our pilot efforts, particularly in the context of the human lung. So I think one of the, one of the biggest challenges, which I referred to briefly, is you know, how do we deal with, with the multiple scales that we have to be able to model uh, in the context of human variation? Uh, you know, do we have to build a single CCF for the entire human body? Can we build individual organ level coordinate frameworks and then stitch those together, which I think is probably how we're going to start? And it's worth noting that that's both a technological question, but also one about biological in interpretation. So for example, if we want to build a series of organ level CCFs and combine that into a body level framework, we can certainly do that. But we're making an assumption when we do that, that the sort of relative size and position of human organs in relationship to each other is going to be relatively fixed. So if we're interested in, for example, seeing how the distance between the lung and the heart varies across individuals, then we need to have a whole body-wide CCF. But if we're interested, uh, if we're willing to take those locations, at least as a first approximation is fixed, then we can proceed to the organ level. So th those are decisions that we're gonna have to make for each of these individual projects. What are the, the spatial data sets that we have? And what's the level of biological variability that we actually want to model? I think the, the other really challenging and actually intellectually fascinating question to me is, is how do we sort of uh, construct a reference that's robust to this anatomical levels of variation and how do we select these origin points uh, or landmarks uh, individually in different tissues? So, you know, we can do that in a supervised way where pathologists or tissue generators, uh, you know, physically mark uh, on their data where, where these anatomical landmarks are located. We can do this in an unsupervised way where those features are learned directly from the data with machine learning uh, or something in between. Uh, we have to decide what really is going to be the scale of conservation that we can accept as, as a landmark. What does it mean for something to be really robustly present across individuals? And we have to have trade-offs in terms of the information content or the interpretability of a landmark. We may be able to define a feature that could be learned by a computer that's extremely robust across individuals, but if a pathologist can't annotate that on a slide or it doesn't fit into an existing biological framework, it may not be particularly useful for us. So these are decisions that we have to make. We also have to think about how, sort of, how we can go about this process of constructing an anatomical template, and in particular, how many individuals we need before we can be confident that we robustly sampled a sufficient amount of variation. This is similar to the problem of deciding how many individuals we need to construct or to, to sample when, when profiling a cellular atlas. Uh, how do we update the CCF iteratively with new data? Uh, and how often should we update it, and when are we done? So these are really, really broad uh, and challenging questions. I want to highlight that I, I think each of these questions is going to be, have to be addressed individually in the context of each organ or tissue uh, where, where a coordinate framework is constructed. Um, we wanted to start at least to make these questions concrete by working in a pilot system, and we, we chose to work in the lung. Uh, and and I, I don't think that the answers that we come up with in the lung are immediately going to generalize to other tissues, but hopefully the process that we go through in trying to figure out the right strategy, hopefully that will serve as a roadmap uh, for other tissues as well, and that's certainly our goal. So one of the reasons that we chose the lung, and you've heard quite a lot about, about lung single cell data and, and different anatomical sampling strategies, is because there was a very sort of well thought out uh, uh, a tissue sampling process uh, that came along with this particular project. Um, so just to briefly walk you through this, how this is going to work in the context, at least, of the Human Biomolecular Atlas project. Uh, we're going to start with lungs uh, that are, are transparent quality, uh, but, but weren't transplanted, so very high quality tissue. They're going to be inflated to the same pressure to minim minimize anatomical variation during the breathing cycle. Uh, they'll be subjected to very high resolution CT. This is all ex vivo, so there can be very high levels of radiation for high levels of resolution uh, and 3D reconstruction. Uh, then we can actually physically subsection or slice or, or sample from the lung, and in this case they're going to sample along the proximal distal axis, and you start to define almost an initial coordinate framework just in this slicing. 
And then there's a series of iterative additional subsections to, to actually create sections uh, that can be then uh, subjected to downstream uh, analysis. For example, single nucleus sequencing, multiplexed fish, or single cell or single nucleus attack seek. Um, and so actually, if we were just working with one lung only, then we would already have sort of an internal coordinate framework based on this sectioning process. But of course, what we want is to have something that's generalizable across multiple lungs, and of course, is not unique to this particular sampling strategy, which is being used in this project, but could be applied more generally. So that's where we need to have something that's more common across individuals. So one of the other reasons we chose the lung as a pilot is we thought this could be a fascinating opportunity to use sort of naturally occurring landmarks in the tissue. And in, in this case, as, as Aviv and Sarah mentioned, we have these airway branch points that we thought might be able to serve as anatomical landmarks. So you have almost 15 degrees of branching that we can detect uh, in CT scans uh, for each individual lobe. Uh, and and that, that gives us an opportunity to sort of use those to, to facilitate registration uh, across individuals. And then we can use sort of very easily visible or recognizable branch points, for example, the endpoint of the, of the right major bronchus uh, as an origin point, for example, for a coordinate system. I'll just mention that, you know, in, as an alternate approach that we're, I won't talk about much today, we're also exploring approaches where the organ shape and the sort of silhouette of the organ itself uh, would also be used as a landmark, uh, which we think is also a particularly exciting alternative. Okay, so the idea here is that, you know, if we have a, a variety of spatial data sets, in this case it's going to be extremely high level CT or high resolution CT, uh, we would start by masking that, that, uh, the relevant tissue away. We would start by then segmenting uh, these airways, uh, detecting and annotating those airway branch points. Then once we've done this across a sufficient number of samples, we can sort of uh, register these to each other and start to build an anatomical scaffold. And that registration typically is gonna take place in two steps. Uh, the first is gonna be some sort of global transformation to account just for changes in, in the overall size of the lung. And the second will be much more nonlinear sort of fine scale tuning to, to align uh, at, at a much lower level of, higher level of resolution. We can iterate this process to construct an average template and then we can select an origin point for our coordinate system. So I'll, I'll just show you a little bit of our, our very early efforts. We don't have a full coordinate system yet, but we have some, some nice images. And so this is a, a, a CT, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the lung. You can see how sort of gorgeous and how beautifully exquisite these branching patterns are from, from the different airways and how that sort of tree-like, fractal-like structure uh, seems like it might be able to give rise uh, to a coordinate system. Uh, it's also a bit of a curse, though, because, of course, there are so many branches, we have to be able to annotate those in some sort of automated way. We don't want to be able to go in by hand and, for each sample, have to an annotate thousands of branch points. So we have to be able to design methods to do that, and we'll have to do that for each of the tissues that we look at. Uh, so we've been working with uh, a variety of machine learning approaches, first to segment out uh, the different branches, and we've had some success there. Uh, and then we actually need to annotate these, these individual branch points. And I'll just show you one sort of cool result because I think it's, it's really neat, and Sarah highlighted this a little bit ago. How can we sort of train a model to, to, mod, to, to point out sort of in an unsupervised way where those branches are? And so this is a result from Tommaso and Vrishali at the Broad, and they had the idea that you could actually sort of simulate training data uh, for a lung by, by basically constructing synthetic fractals where we, of course, know where the actual branch points are. You can make as many of these as you want because it's synthetic. Uh, you can train, the, to train a, a nice neural network architecture. And what's really remarkable about that this is if we then apply that to lung CT data, which is, of course, not a synthetic fractal, we are able to detect the actual branch points for the lung, which is, which is really, really cool. And now we have an opportunity to take these into registration processes and start to build this anatomical scaffold. And I hope to be able to tell you more about that in the near future. Um, we're also going to sort of test a variety of iterative procedures for constructing these anatomical templates. Do we start with one sample alone and align to that, as they've done, for example, in the Telerike and, and ICBM projects? Uh, or do we build a small subset of samples to use as an iterative framework? Uh, and we hope that these sort of, uh, uh, sort of iterative uh, tests will, will sort of tell us when to stop and, and what is the right strategy for, for dealing with, with anatomical diversity. Um, the last thing that I'll mention briefly is, is, you know, as valuable as it is to create a CCF, one of the biggest challenges on top of that is then how do we align or, or map new data onto that reference framework? And we sort of think of there being three general possibilities for how this procedure could work. The first is that you might have a data type that's sort of inherently alignable. So, for example, if you've generated an atlas with a CT or a spatial transcriptomics type workflow, and then you generate a new spatial transcriptomics experiment, it should be easy to register that back onto your existing framework. It's essentially a problem of image registration. But we're not always going to be so lucky. We're going to have cases where we're going to, for example, want to collect single cell RNA-seq data and map that back onto a spatial framework. And so how are we going to do that? And there are a couple of options here for how that could work. The first we sort of refer to as collecting spatial metadata during sampling collection. So that, in that case, you know, when the sample is actually taken uh, by the surgeon, 
Uh, we want to be able to note its location as precisely as possible in relationship to the established landmarks that we've previously discovered. And that's one of the reasons why we want those landmarks to be interpretable and to fit into existing biological frameworks. Uh, this is actually the basis of sort of stereotactic surgical procedures, and I like that analogy because that's very much a similar type of workflow that's going to occur for the collection of many HCA samples. And then the last method, which is, which is much more intellectually uh, challenging but, but fascinating, is to try to identify correspondences uh, between very, very different types of data. Uh, and this would enable you to be able to map across different technologies or to be able to map across different scales. And so one real you know, challenge here, for example, is the integration of sequencing and image-based single-cell RNA-seq profiles, uh, assuming that there are shared biological states that exist across these experiments. And so you saw in basically all of the examples that have even Sarah showed today that there's both spatial and sequencing data that's being collected at single-cell resolution. So how are we going to sort of integrate those two things together? I'll just show two quick slides for, for uh, some methods that we've developed, but this is a very active area of computational methods development in the community. For example, to take single-cell RNA-seq data that's been collected from the mouse cortex, uh, but also imaging, multiplexed imaging data from this beautiful technology, StarMap, where they were able to measure a thousand genes, and they know exactly where each molecule is located, but they don't have the whole transcriptome. Uh, and so we've designed a series of methods that, that would enable you to basically identify correspondences, so to be able to find when one cell is in one data set, where is its homolog or its analogous cell located in the other? How can we sort of link the sequencing and spatial data sets together? I won't have time today to tell you how this works. This, this data set is, uh, this manuscript is available on BioArchive and will come out soon. Um, what it enables us to do is to take all the different clusters that we had identified with single-cell RNA-seq and then ask where are they physically located in the tissue. And the, the cortex is kind of a nice test case for this because we know in excitatory cells we should see this sort of beautiful laminar structure. Um, but for other cell types, uh, things look much more dispersed. But we think that as we can start to scale these data sets up to much higher levels of resolution, and as you already saw from Aviv and Sarah, we can start to sort of uncover the founding organizational principles uh, which, which give rise to human tissues, which we think is very exciting. Um, the very last slide that I'll say is, is you know, you know we're, we're really excited about what are some of the potential key use cases of the CCF, uh, to be able to understand the molecular basis of variation across individuals, to identify changes that occur either across gender or across lifetimes, uh, and really to understand sort of this link between the molecular data that we're collecting and its spatial organization. How does the same cell type change depending on where it's located in the body and who it's next to? And these are questions that we're really interested in. And if you're interested in these too, uh, please do come to uh, the breakout session that we have tomorrow, uh, which is organized with by, by myself and Ajay Pillai uh, on the common coordinate framework. And we're particularly interested to hear the cases where you would like to use the CCF and the levels of resolution that you need to answer your biological questions of interest. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll particularly thank uh, uh, John and Aviv. Uh, you know, one of our initial goals is uh, to, uh, to solve the John Marioni hair common coordinate framework. Uh, and uh, happy to take any questions. Thanks. <laughs> Maybe we have time for one or two questions in the front. Hi, uh, Laura Clark at the DCP. So obviously, th this is really important to be able to build the atlas and interpret it. And I'd love to know what you think the sorts of values we might need to record in the metadata, so the data yeah. that's collected over the next couple of years in the DCP is still useful in, say, five years' time? Yeah, I think that's a really important question. As much as I'd like to pretend that every piece of data we collect is going to be magically mapped with some crazy machine learning algorithm back to a common coordinate framework, I think we are going to rely heavily on the spatial metadata that's collected um, as part of the anatomical sampling. And what, of course, is really challenging there is we have to establish those guidelines now because once you collect that sample, you're never going to be able to go back and do that again. And so I think that's a particularly important uh, aspect to highlight, especially when we're thinking about working uh, and, and integrating data across different consortia, where each is going to have a different working group and a different sample collection pipeline. So all I can really say at the moment is, uh, if you're interested in that, please do come to the breakout session, and I'd love to talk about ways that we can have different groups talking to each other at an early stage, so at least everybody is collecting around the same types of data that will make integration downstream much easier. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, one back there. Last one. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the great talk. Um, so especially in a heterogeneous organ like the long, I'm thinking about spatial transcriptomics because that's what we work on. You know, the fields of view are pretty small compared to the sort of core yeah. CT. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out as we work towards bigger fields of view, I mean, I guess it, 
one way to just be would know where the sample sample was taken from, but it's going to be tricky, right? If you're doing it at a CT level, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about how you're going to be able to connect the two. No, I think that's that's actually probably the greatest challenge that we'll face is the spark. So if you think about it, sort of from the context of collecting single cell RNA seq data, we're probably sampling the vast majority of cell types that are there. Of course, there are going to be ultra rare types that we might need a billion cells, but the vast majority we have good coverage of that space. We're going to have exceptionally poor coverage. Uh, from a spatial context, right? The, the, the level of sparsity is going to be extremely high. Uh, and that's going to affect the level of resolution that it even makes sense for us to map to, because if we're never going to collect the same region, homologous region, from two individuals. And I think one of the things that makes this challenging is we don't know exactly the, the, spa the scale at which these fields of view are going to grow over time. And I, I think that's something that, that, that does create challenges in terms of the level of resolution we need. So again, please come to the breakout session. It'd be fun to discuss that. Great. Thank you, Rahul. So next will be the analysis working group and data annotation presented by Dana, John, and Peter. And you guys have 25 minutes uh, plus five minutes for Q&A. So please. OK. Um, so in the analysis working group, uh, we really try and do two key things. Um, really identify the key computational problems that we need to solve in. In Aviv's roadmap earlier today, she liked to sweep under the, the rug just how challenging uh, the analysis is to really take all this data, integrate it into a usable atlas, and we saw just an example from rule one type of analysis challenge. How are we going to even put it all together spatially? And um, we, we want to span the full gamut of developing biological uh, uh, computational tools that will empower the biologists to do the analysis themselves powerfully and robustly, all the way to developing methods to do really cool analysis and integration to ask new questions that we wouldn't have imagined possible before that. So our primary role really is to sort of identify the questions, the methods that are needed, get the community together around solving them, and really educate and particularly um, uh, do workshops and jamborees and really target uh, the younger generation as well as cross-disciplinary uh, in interactions. Oh, where's the thing that makes this thing go forward? Ah, okay, this thing. And so in the recent time, we've been uh, really focusing on, on a number of questions. Uh, how do we actually design an atlas? Uh, some engagement with the individual projects. You just heard rule about the um, common coordinate framework. And uh, you'll, you'll hear later on about uh, the, the common platform. And really what makes... Uh, I really want to focus on one challenge that is a little bit swept under the rug, and, and, and I really want to raise this as something that needs to be solved and right now doesn't have enough part of the community engaging it, and it's normalization. If we're going to put the atlas together, if we're going to take all these samples and put them in a coherent uh, an, uh, uh, atlas, even in a single sample, there's so much technical variation that the methods to normalize a single sample properly, taking into account all this technical variation, are not yet fully resolved. And recently, there have been a couple of publications that have shown that some of the common things that we like to do, normalize all the cells to the same size, which is sometimes really bad. You certainly want to do that in a cell type specific manner. And log normalization and all sorts of other things are really not the way to go. But really, it gets much more complicated than that, because we were talking about acquiring these samples, not only from different individuals, not only from different labs, but also some of them will be from autopsy, some of them from reception, some of them from biopsy. So even from the same uh, uh, tissue, for the same cell types, for the same sample type, we're going to acquire the tissue in dramatically different ways, some frozen, some fresh. And all of this is going to have huge impact on, on the data that we collect. And we're going to have to think of a way how we're going to take all these different modalities, combine them in a single atlas, and distinguish what differences are caused by the fact that we took these samples in two completely different manners, frozen, fresh, resection, dead, alive, and what is actually meaningful biological differences based on the genetic variation, the environment, or maybe some uh, trauma operation or something else the individual had. And really building a, a complete atlas from all this is, is an enormous challenge. And really, I'm, I'm raising this as, as a throwback to the audience to try and get people to engage. Here's one little example of how the analysis and the normalization method really makes a difference. 
And you know, without any normalization, here's an example of some developing a mouse embryo. It's actually not human. But what you see is the common method to normalize, which actually works very frequently and does a good job for many, many data uh, types doesn't work well. That's in the middle because it's assuming that all the samples are the same and there's actually variation over development, over a full day of development. So it assumes too much similarity and sort of smushes the samples together. Whereas you need to actually, in this case, understand that there are similarities and differences in your data and model that appropriately. And the main point of this slide is that there's no single right uh, normalization methods. It depends on the data you've collected. It depends on the downstream analysis you want to apply. You'd need to apply different normalization if you want to optimize clustering or to differential express genes that you identify. And there's no one size fits all, which makes this all the more complicated. So take home thoughts from normalization. And I, we really thought it was important to flag how important this normalization problem is both for anyone who's analyzing this data, how your data has been normalized and what normalization procedure has been applied to the data really influences the conclusions you can derive when doing downstream analysis. So if you're a user, be aware of this normalization. And calling on the computational biologist, this particular problem right now is underserved. And we're calling anyone who's uh, really interested in, in helping solve this huge problem. And there's going to be a breakout to address uh, this problem. So now I bring it on to John. Thank you, Dana. So it's a very natural segue in some sense from um, challenges in normalization and a particular part of the analysis pipeline to how we're going to work together with the data coordination platform who are going to speak after us about actually analyzing the data in a common way across different data sets. And so one part, a, a very important part of the analysis working group's role is to interact with the DCP, in particular with the analysis team in the DCP, so that's primarily based at the Broad Institute with Tim and Kylie, but also with others, about discussing what are going to be some of those common analysis methods that are applied to all of the data sets that are ingested into the DCP. And so Nir Raul and myself form this little sub-team here, and together with um, the guys at the Brood, we've, we discuss and, dis and consider various options for all of these steps, not only normalization, of course, but the upstream steps, and also how you're going to quality control data, ensuring that we get a high quality data set. It's garbage in, garbage out. We've got to ensure not that we're going to eliminate data, but that cells are marked as high quality or low quality, and that requires robust comp quality control metrics. And then eventually, once we're a little bit more established with this, and as Dana says, we're clearly not quite there yet with having a one-size-fits-all normalization strategy. I'm not sure we ever will have a one-size-fits-all normalization strategy that's always going to be a little bit horses for courses. Then going on to the more downstream analysis tasks and having those processed in a uniform way and how we're going to integrate a variety of different data sets both within a cell type and ultimately across cell types so that, for example, we could look at tissue resident immune cells and compare them in a meaningful way across different data sets. And that's ultimately what we would like the DCP to be able to accomplish. As well as um, our role with the DCP, um, which is, of course, fun, there's also more obvious fun in some sense in that we do a lot of community engagement. And in particular, as Dana alluded to, trying to not just get PIs in a room together, but a particular younger scientists, so postdocs, PhD students. And one really fun way that we've done that, and I think it's been very successful, is we've organized a series of analysis jamborees where students, postdocs from a variety of labs from across the world all get together. And over the course of two, three days, they come to one physical location and they work on a particular computational problem or a set of problems. So the first related to things around normalization, Stan alluded to, very important. The second, more experimental design, the first took place in Hingston, shown here in the bottom left, and the second in Boston. And we're getting ready to organize a third and other sorts of jamborees in the near future. So do keep that in mind. We will be advertising that fairly soon. And not only is this a nice interactive environment where people can get together, it actually has very concrete actions. So um, one very concrete action is the generation of this paper, this empty drops paper. So for those of you who are not familiar, one of the challenges, especially with droplet-based technologies, is determining which drop contains a cell. And there are a variety of approaches that one could take to do this. You could just threshold on the number of UMIs, but you risk missing out to small cells that are maybe going to be underrepresented if you just have a hard filter. And so as actually the first HCA jamboree, they came up with a novel method 
in order to distinguish empty drops from um, um, genuinely droplets that contain cells. And this was published, and now it's part of a lot of analysis pipelines. Indeed, this is now part of the te core 10x analysis pipeline. So it's a really concrete action that came out of the HCA and getting these young scientists together. And I would point out that the first five authors here, they all come from different labs from different parts of the world. So this really was a fantastic exercise. And I think that it's been a great way of getting the community to come together. And as we do more of these moving forward, we're very grateful, of course, for the support from CZI and also from Amazon Web Services that we were able to do this. And we're very excited to be organizing more of these moving forward. So that's all I really want to say about our interactions with the DCP and community engagement. And for the rest of the time here, Peter is going to focus on the common annotation platform, which is really an up and coming and very exciting aspect of work within the analysis working group. Thank you, John. Does this work? Can you hear the mic? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, so one of the challenges that we've identified, I think, from the past uh, HCA meetings is, is that of uh, annotation coordination. And this is a snapshot of uh, Tabula Murray's atlas from CZI Biohab. Uh, and in fact, uh, Steve Quick was talking about this yesterday about ongoing work and, and highlighted the challenge of annotating this. In this case, it's all under the same roof or the basically same institution uh, or institutions across the bay, let's say. Uh, and it took a lot of effort to actually make sure that they could annotate in a common way. Um, I think they've had to design their own infrastructure, some scripts, you know, common things that people were supposed to use, uh, an ontology uh, to, to, to sort of focus them on, a, on a common terms and so on. So obviously doing something like this in the context of a, of a much larger project of, uh, such as HCA is going to be a challenge. And what we would like to do is to build a, a platform that would, that would facilitate this. So just to kind of generally highlight the types of challenges and, and the situation uh, that, that's current, is that most of the annotation is essentially done manually at this point. Uh, that means uh, you need to bring an expert uh, to, to, to look at the data in, in a way that they would like, uh, which is often you know, quite different from what typical bioinformatics analysis would, would give you. Uh, and, uh, and you have to record their thoughts in some sort of a structured manner. And typically, this appears as a figure in the in a paper, and, and that's it. And it's not actually accessible in, in an easy way through any database and so on. Now, we would like to do this automatically. And obviously, there, there are some molecular signatures that are so prominent, we should be able to do this automatically. But for more subtle signatures, you know, particular subtypes of cells or states of cells, uh, it becomes a challenge. And, and, and I think a big part of this challenge, we're pretty good at building classifiers, I think, as, as, as a community in general. But uh, the challenge is that you need to have a knowledge base from which you could learn these patterns. And, and right now, again, unless you, you, you put a lot of effort into collecting, let's say, annotations from different papers and so on, uh, you don't really have a good unified database. There, there, there are a number of, I think, attempts across the world. Um, also, you know, if you do this, you get sort of singular opinions of, of, you know, of experts uh, uh, that worked on this particular data set. But in order to actually learn robustly, you'd like to have opinions of multiple experts looking at the same data. Um, and, and obviously, the variation, the terminology that different experts would use is also important. Um, so we would like to be able to basically collect uh, this uh, uh, a diverse set of expert opinions, particularly on the HCA data, uh, and, and learn from it. And so the basic idea for this uh, uh, central, uh, centralized annotation uh, platform, CAP, um, is to have a, a centralized database where these types of annotations are stored. Now, that's the easy part. Now, the hard part is to actually make sure that it's convenient enough and general enough uh, so people actually start contributing to this and that we can eventually learn from this. So that's the, first of all, the whole thing is, is still on paper. It's now built. Um, and so we would like everyone's input if, if you have uh, comments and ideas on this. But the, the current outline is such that you know, this, this is the database that would actually, in some cloud database that would store the information. But the important bits are around it. So uh, it's, uh, we'll focus on these annotation clients. They're essentially user interfaces that would make it uh, straightforward for biology experts and, and, and teams actually working on the interpretation of the data to contribute this. And hopefully we can make them attractive enough so they start using it in their own sort of day-to-day -day work as well. Um, uh, there, this is the, the box sort of that, that we would like to create eventually. Uh, these would be automated annotation tools. And again, the idea will be that uh, different groups uh, across the world and part of HCA community as well would develop those and, and, and CAP would simply serve as a registry so 
uh, people can uh, discover them and make use of them. And obviously all of this is connected to DCP uh, where the actual raw data is sitting. Okay, so a little bit about annotation clients. So the, the, uh, a number of uh, sort of user interfaces now for viewing single cell data, let's say particularly RNA-seq data and interacting with it, looking at differential expression markers and so on. And, and so one of the first things we'd like to do is to build sort of modular interfaces, essentially dialogues that, uh, that could be integrated with these systems, uh, a variety of systems, uh, that would allow you to work with the annotations. Okay, so here, here are sort of mockups. So the you know, basic idea, if you're looking at a data set, let's say an HCA data set, uh, that other people have already looked at and, and expressed opinions about, um, this uh, module would pull them up from the centralized database and you would see uh, let's say a multiple users that have contributed an annotations you know, for this particular data set. Um, we would like the whole thing to be quite democratic. So in principle, any registered user should be able to go and contribute their opinions. But obviously there'll be um, sort of very uh, well-rated uh, opinions and, and others that are perhaps not, not as thorough. Um, so that's going to be one of the challenges you know, to basically establish a rating system uh, and, and get user feedback to sort of maintain this properly. Uh, because if, if you have, let's say, 100 users that have uh, expressed opinions about this data set, you don't necessarily want to see all of them at once. Uh, in any case, you have a UI of, uh, that would allow you to sort of uh, pick and, and sort through these. Uh, whenever you have uh, sort of labels or, or annotations, uh, we could also show gene markers that, that, are actually as, uh, that, that are associated with them. Now, I should mention, you know, what, what do we mean by annotation? And there are various ways of looking at it. What we mean is basically an association between uh, a given term, you know, a label of some sort, uh, and a set of cells that are actually annotated this way. Uh, that's it. Now, once you have that, you could try to derive, you know, molecular signatures, um, uh, some kind of abstract models, and so on. But uh, we're focused on just uh, maintaining the, that, that association, the action that a particular label is assigned a particular set of cells in a particular um, uh, data set. Of course, with that, uh, you can have additional metadata such as evidence that, that you know, people have used for this, uh, the type of you know, method they've used for this, and all logic and probability of assignment as well. Okay, so uh, if uh, because, you know, if we have a number of these data sets and, and a variety of experts contributing this, uh, for a given label, let's say a particular term, um, uh, you can actually get quite a bit of information. And so the, uh, there's a notion of this kind of uh, gene cards-like uh, uh, page, but for, for cell, you know, cell types, cell cards, let's say. And the idea is that you can, you can look at associated terms, uh, the ones that, you know, perhaps represent, you know, supersets, uh, more general cell types, or uh, uh, subdivisions of that cell type, let's say. Um, we should be able, because again, we know all the relationships between the terms in the database, we should be able to deduce which terms are actually synonymous, right? And it's very important because, you know, one of the key aims here, as I'll show in the, in the next slide, is to try to get commu community to slowly converge in common terminology without necessarily forcing them to do so right away. So synonymous terms are essentially terms that, you know, people would use and we would like them to, uh, to describe the same thing and would like them to converge, let's say, in something closer to the top. Uh, sibling terms, you know, more, probably more biological indifference. And again, you can explore the, the expression signatures, you know, put in your own genes here, your own terms, and so on. Um, important thing is that you should be able to see an overview of other data sets where that particular term has been used, and that should just be a convenient way of navigating through the collection. Um, and perhaps, you know, literature and so on. All right, so the key thing in order for all of this to work, right, is we have to make it easy um, and, and effective for people to actually contribute annotations. And I should say right away that, you know, I'm talking mostly about sort of public HCA data sets, but in order to make the system attractive and useful, um, we would also have sort of a private mode where essentially you can just work on your own data without necessarily exposing it. Um, and just, just to make sure that the tools, the UIs are convenient enough. So if, let's say, you're working with a data set and you've highlighted a particular subpopulation based on whatever markers or strategy you used, uh, you should be able to put in a number of terms for it, right? And then that's straightforward and then just say save or contribute. Now, the, the key thing is here, is what, what we would like to do is to give helpful suggestions for, uh, for the person annotating it. 
And, and we have a number of, of sources of information that we could use for this. Obviously, if you're typing in a label, we could do a text matching to autocomplete or to find, for instance, a synonym term that is more common uh, than the one you're trying to type literally, right? So that, that would be sort of trying to correct, suggest you know, a more common term and, and try to drive towards convergence of terms. Now, obviously, you, we could also, once you've highlighted the population, we could look up the molecular information uh, about it, let's say gene expression profiles. And, and that can be used immediately to try to suggest informative terms. Again, they can be rated based on, you know, on their molecular match, based on the popularity of their use, and so on. And you know, initially, that's not going to be very strong because, again, as I mentioned, you want know, to have a good learning base to discern, you know, fine cell types and so on. But uh, that particular method, you know, predicting based on molecular signatures, should get you know more and more powerful with time. Uh, similarly, we'd like to encourage, for instance, experts to consider child terms, right? If they're annotating just, let's say, a T lymphocyte, you know, perhaps we can ask them to try to distinguish, you know, which one it is. Maybe they can do that. Um, yes. So uh, again, you know, the assumption here is that uh, obviously we'll have a lot of informative contribution that we'll be able to um, rank, rank them appropriately and, and make use of them in, in, in providing these suggestions. And the aim is to basically uh, try to converge on a more common set of terms. Um, and automated annotations, I already mentioned this, essentially what we would like to do is to um, serve as a as a disc, you know, registry, essentially, for automated tools. So there are a number of groups developing these classifiers for, um, for automatically assigning cell types, cell states, and so on. And, and simply, you know, in viewing a particular data set, you would have a tab where you, you're able to look through them. Uh, maybe they'll have their own rating, and then you just pick one and, and run it on your data, just a convenience routine. Um, yeah, sorry, I skipped something here. Yeah. Yeah, this is annotation engines. All right. Um, so again, I think the, the aim here is, is to come up with a centralized platform that would try to encourage um, uh, both, both uh, contribution of annotations and then uh, also use of, of common terms. Um, I think that's the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And we have some time for questions. So, Sham. Uh. Uh, Peter, I have a question about the, uh, your last part. Uh, I think the, I can see how many different people can, based on their knowledge, annotate this one embedding of this one set of cells. But if you have many people in the world generating many data sets using many different embeddings and clustering them differently, yeah. uh, how, how do you sensibly annotate that? You know, because uh, this person's embedding and clustering will have half of the cells that that person would have put in a different cluster yeah. and half of the cells that would put in yet another cluster. And how do you get any coherence and if the underlying objects that these annotators are annotating don't agree with each other? Right. So I think as far as embeddings and, and sort of molecular projections of the data, uh, that's all fair game, right? Uh, depending on how you look at it, you might be able to distinguish features uh, you know, that, that are different and, and highlight a set of cells. I think if people are annotating on a subset of, of cells, that's a bit more problematic. Uh, again, all these clients, uh, the, the, these analysis systems or viewing systems, they're quite well aware, aware of what per person is looking at. You know, if they're only looking at a small subset of cells and highlighted you know, two of them set as a T lymphocyte, we can uh, record that fact that it was an incomplete view of some sort. Um, I think, you know, the, but beyond that, you know, in terms of views and so on, the, the key thing we're really learning from this is, is molecular signatures, right? So as long as we can you know, get that association, um, uh, for, for us, uh, uh, over time, they'll be very useful. And, and talking about sort of a scale of you know, many data sets, many people trying to work on them, um, the, that's where all the automated tools eventually should, you know, hope will take over. But in order to get to that point, we, we, we need to get expert opinions, you know, and a variety of them as well. Okay, I think there's a question from Aviv. Uh, my question is to Dana about the normalization. What, besides many computational people thinking about the problem, which you clearly said we should, what else could be done that would help in assessing the success of normalization? Um, 
So that's part of it. We're going to actually try and put a workshop together. It's, uh, Can you use a microphone? Oh. Thanks. I thought I'm loud enough. No, but For it's the also live, stream. live streamed. Ah, live stream. Okay. So right now we're in the process of defining what's needed to scale, uh, what's needed to evaluate normalization, how many normalizations do we want to do, what type of modeling. There are many challenges. Therefore, we're thinking of putting together a workshop and inviting uh, computational people, both that are in the community and also targeting computational people that we hope to entice into the community and really come together over two, three days. This is going to be uh, jointly uh, organized with the CZI. And actually finding a, a date that works has been the, the challenge right now, probably sometime in, in the fall, late fall uh, this coming year. And hopefully, at the end of this workshop, I'll be able to answer all your questions. <laughs> Excellent. I think there's a question from Bruce. Uh, great work, you guys. Um, Dana, I completely agree about the um, um, normalization problem. It's, it's not going to go away. And, and so there's some important features that um, us old guys could offer that, that might be um, considered to be part of the annotation process as well as something that could be um, maybe inferred through some uh, machine learning based approaches. And a um, couple of parameters are, and this actually goes to some of Raul's um, um, questions too on common coordinates. We need to know cell size. We need to know cell shape. We need to know nuclear volume um, and, and sort of eccentricity. So stuff that's, that has you know, some correlation to cell differentiation state, but a lot of it is, is also cell state and, and you know, characteristics of in-class in um, aspects of a cell. And so knowing that will let us kind of understand what's the distribution of, of um, you know, uh, transcripts in a nucleus and in the cell, maybe even eventually asymmetrically in the cell distribution. So all that stuff is going to really help figure out, like, what's, this, what's the cell's strategy for, um, you know, becoming elongated. So, so let's say in the common coordinate framework, once we, you know, we see, um, you know, long structures versus uh, compact structures, we, we need to have a cell parameter in there about was, was there a genetic change in cell size or, or was this because of more cells present of that differentiated type, for example. So, so thanks for the advice. And again, anyone who is interested in contributing or thinking about this problem and I'm not aware of, uh, please send me an email. I don't think we're going to be able to get these parameters for each cell in the database, even though having some type of benchmarking data sets to help understand and model the problem that includes these parameters will be valuable. It's my fear that actually the biggest you know, confounders in normalization are not going to be the actual biology of the cell, but the actual process in which that cell was turned into uh, a bunch of reads. There, there is some truth, though, that the cells are in, in truth states, and so our, what our measurements do to approximate that, I think we've got to come to better terms with. So, sorry, I know there are a couple of questions, but I would love to maybe hold that off for working groups, uh, so breakout sessions. Yes, there's a breakout, so please attend. Yes, so let's thank them, all the speakers, one more time. Thank you. So I'm trying to go so we can give you some coffee as soon as possible. So I'll do my best here. So next will be on data coordination platform and be presented by Laura Clark, Brian O'Connor, and Kylie Digantano. So please. Hi. So thank you, thank you to the organizers for inviting us here today to give you an update again about the data coordination platform. Um, and so for, in case there are people in the audience who haven't seen a sort of overview of the DCP before, um, you know, because uh, we, obviously we have new members of the community here with us. Just for sort of an overview, the, the basic idea of the platform is to provide a cloud-based infrastructure that supports the community discovering, sharing, analyzing, and exploring all of the data, because this is such a vast amount of data that we've heard about from Aviv and Sarah, and we want to make it easy for everybody to be able to get involved, whether you've come from a small lab or a giant center, um, and, and so this is really part of the, um, the point. Um, and I'm going to give a bit of insight into the data. And hopefully, if uh, uh, oh, we've got Kylie and Brian off stage, which is good because they disappeared. And I, 
I was concerned I was going to give the whole presentation. Um, uh, sort of going to talk about the analysis pipelines and the, the sort of tools we're building to access the data. So here we have, first of all, a real thanks to everybody who's already got involved and is starting sharing the data with us. Um, this is both from um, published data sets, preprints, and, and there is pre-publication data, and we're very grateful for everybody who's doing that. Um, there's many different data um, centers who are working with us, and of course the data wranglers, some of whom are here, you'll see a number of us have badges on that you can ask us about the DCP, um, who are working with everybody to get the data in. Um, one of the important things we've established recently with the help of, of the governance group of the data coordination platform is sort of a data prioritization. We want to hear about and learn about all of the new sorts of data that you're generating. I think I saw on slides sort of proteomics data sort of on the roadmap, but we also, it's much easier for us to take in, say, 10x and SmartSeq2 established data that we already have pipelines for and we understand much better the um, sort of how to, how to collect metadata for than some of the new, newer data types. And so the timescales on which the data can enter the platform changes depending on the sort of data and the sort of um, tissue it comes from. Uh, and right now it's important to note that we can't take data that isn't consented for open release. You'll hear more from the ethics working group um, about what the plans are there uh, sort of to ensure all sorts of data can be accepted, but the DCP will have to catch up to make sure we can support um, um, in an appropriate uh, sort of responsible sh uh, data sharing framework for, for other sorts of data. But do, do talk to us about all of your data. We want to know about your, um, about your plans so we can plan and prioritize our, our own work um, in the same sense. And then the sorts of data that we have on the horizon, again, 10X and SmartSeq are the data types that we have most of. But we're also seeing all sorts of different droplet-based um, uh, technologies, um, single nuclei, sequencing, single cell attack seek. And then we're working quite closely with the Space TX consortium, who have been mentioned a couple of times already, to ensure that the platform can support all of the imaging um, technologies that are coming forward. And we have both sort of human and mouse data and from a, a wide variety of different organ systems that will, I'm sure, continue to expand as we sell from all the different Atlas projects that were mentioned. And now I'm going to hand over to Kylie, who will talk about um, the pipeline works that's being done. Thanks, Laura. As it was highlighted by Donna and John, to be able to create an Atlas of all of the human cells, we need to process the data in a consistent and standardized way. To accomplish this in the platform, we ingest the data as raw data and metadata, and then we process it using our standardized pipelines, which are developed with guidance from the analysis working group, Ambrose Carr and Tim Tickle. In November, we updated you on our SmartSeq2 pipeline, which we use to analyze paired-end SmartSeq2 data from human. And I want to say thank you to Janice Poroy for making these awesome pipeline diagrams. Today, we're excited to update you on our newest pipeline for the HCA called Optimus. It's been developed to analyze 10x V2 chemistry 3' prime single cell RNA sequencing data from humans. Optimus takes in fast cues and produces a GA4GH compliant aligned BAM, a cell by gene count matrix, and QC metrics for cells and genes. It's been optimized to run in production on the cloud and benchmarked against community standards and it's also been developed to be easily extensible to other droplet-based assays. As Laura noted, we have some key data sets in the platform that are from mouse. So our next steps are to extend our pipelines to be able to analyze mouse cells. This will actually enable us to be able to process over 90% of the cells that are currently in the platform. After that, we're looking to extend Optimus to be able to analyze other types of droplet-based assays, like DropSeq, DrunkSeq, nuclei sequencing from 10x, and 10x V3 chemistry. After that, we're very excited to be able to support other assays in the future, like Laura mentioned, ATAC-seq, bulk imaging. When you submit your data to the platform, it will all be analyzed alongside the raw data and metadata and made available immediately in the data platform. The uh, pipelines will all be kept up to date, and the data and metadata as it updates will be kept in sync with the rest of the Atlas. Everything we do is for the community, and our pipelines are all open source. The pipeline from, for Optimus is found in the Human Cell Atlas GitHub organization. It can be found on DocStore, and it can be run in Terra, an analysis platform. There you can test out the pipeline for yourself and run it on your controlled access data. 
We're really looking forward to your feedback on Optimus in the next round of beta testing. And now I'll hand off to Brian to update you on our first round of beta testing and the data portal. Thank you, Kylie. So uh, as Aviv mentioned um, at the beginning of the conference, um, we have been working towards um, improving the DCP overall and getting feedback uh, from the community. Um, so at the beginning of the year, we wrapped up our first um, beta of the platform. And we got a wonderful amount of feedback from the community. So first of all, thanks to all the testers um, in the audience that provided feedback uh, in this process. So what was good? People liked the look and feel of the site. Uh, they were able to use the documentation. And they were able to use the command line tools um, to actually perform a download. Um, opportunities for improvement. Uh, we um, know that uh, accessing uh, scientific metadata uh, was something that was an opportunity for improvement. Uh, increasing the download speeds and uh, making the directory structure uh, more accessible was another area. And uh, downloading matrix files uh, and understanding the matrix service was another area uh, uh, of opportunities for improvement. OK, so in terms of taking that feedback and translating it into improvements in the data browser, the data portal, uh, on the data browser side, this is uh, the fasted browser that allows you to find uh, data in the DCP. Uh, we uh, introduced a faster command line tool for downloading data in parallel and avoiding duplicate downloads. We also um, enhanced the manifest that you get back from your search result to include a bunch of metadata that helps you figure out um, for the files that you download, how do you link them back to the samples and the metadata about the project and the samples. And we've enhanced the way that we've uh, integrated the matrix service, making that faster and more smooth uh, for users to use. Finally, we're working right now on the handoff mechanism to third-party tertiary analysis portals. I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in the next slide. As far as the project page goes, another area that we learned from the beta um, that we could make improvements on was just making data for a given project a lot easier to access. And so now, if you go to the project page for a given project, you can see that there's a very convenient way of getting a dump of the metadata as a TSV file. This is something that you can easily open in Excel or a tool of your choice uh, to access the metadata for that project. And also, we're working right now on cell by gene matrices um, being pre-computed on a per-project basis, just to make it super quick and easy to get access to data um, on a per-project basis. So these are some uh, areas that we've been improving and addressing the feedback from uh, the first beta. Um, overall, this has contributed to making the DCP and the data portal um, easier to use, more um, accessible, more usable. Um, if you look at the portal right now, uh, you can go into it and use the data browser to explore the data in the platform, to facet on um, your search criteria. And ultimately, you can take that to download data via our command line tool. You can generate a cell by gene matrix. Um, and you can also take the uh, downloaded results, um, use our API, or call the cell by gene matrix through a Jupyter notebook. Something that I'm particularly excited about is the work that we're doing now to enhance the portal by linking out to tertiary analysis portals. So the idea here is this handoff mechanism. What it's doing is providing a mechanism to take your query results and hand it to a third-party analysis portal for performing batch analysis or launching Jupyter Notebook or Spark analysis or providing visualization. So at the end of quarter two, beginning of quarter three, we're focused on the Terra platform right now. This is the broad platform for performing batch analysis and running Jupyter Notebooks. But we're looking to continue to expand this handoff to other tertiary analysis portals throughout quarter three and quarter four. So that's very exciting to be able to link out to the, uh, the community of tertiary analysis portals. OK, so I gave you an idea of the feedback that we got from the beta. Uh, for how you can use the system today. Uh, what I want to be able to show is an example analysis. And so this is based on work that you know, we started back in November and have continued to enhance. The idea here is how can we replicate a sort of typical analysis? So in this example, we looked at replicating the Enge et al. Um, 2017 cell paper. Um, and replicate, what I mean by that is, is in broad brush strokes, do a similar sort of analysis. Um, the idea behind this is we want to provide a high-quality tutorial on our site that shows users how they can find data, uh, find the data behind this study, 
to generate a cell by gene matrix, and ultimately to do a similar sort of analysis um, uh, that was presented in this paper through Jupiter. So I'll just dive into this a little bit more in terms of finding the data. In this tutorial, you can follow through and filter down the projects that contain samples from pancreas and also further refine it down to the project that's associated with this publication. Once you've found that in the data portal, um, you can then click on the button that says Request Expression Matrix, which does exactly what you'd expect. It gives you a few different options for format. And once you click the, uh, the button to generate the matrix, there's a live matrix service request that's happening to assemble that matrix on the fly for you. It takes about a minute or so, and you're able to get um, both a direct download of this matrix and also a URL, which you'll see comes in handy in the next step. OK, and the third step is actually performing analysis in a Jupyter notebook that mimics uh, what this publication was doing. Um, in this case, uh, Genevieve Halliburton um, wrote a notebook to kind of mimic the style of analysis using ScanPy uh, that was shown in this paper. Uh, we modified that notebook to support that URL directly from the matrix service. So in this case, I'm launching the notebook in Terra. You can launch it in uh, mybinder.org, or you can launch it in your local computer using Jupyter Notebook. Uh, but the idea is that you can load this notebook. You can insert the URL that you got from the portal, from your search uh, and your matrix generation request, and then run the notebook uh, start to finish, ultimately producing uh, a UMAP uh, projection similar to what you see in the publication. So this is really, really quite exciting to be able to take it from query to matrix to analysis running in Jupyter Notebook, all from the DCP platform. So what is our future here? What does our future work? Um, the DCP um, right now, the data coordination platform, we're on target for a July 2019 general availability. And what does that concretely mean? That means that we're working on ingesting and using a common metadata model across the projects and also working on transitioning, transitioning our um, uh, beta site, the portal.data.humancellatlas, to our final URL, which is data.humancellatlas.org. Along the way, in continuing, we're going to continue to improve the platform, um, making metadata more accessible, making matrix file download faster and, and easier to use, uh, including support for things like imaging data, uh, expanding tertiary portal handoff over the next several quarters, and also building infrastructure and process around data release. And so that segues nicely into the next slide uh, that I want to introduce the newest team to join the DCP group, and that's the data operations team headed by Mike Cherry, who's going to be working on spearheading that data release process uh, with the group. So with that, um, I just want to say thank you to everyone involved, all the developers, all the HCA community members that have given feedback. Please consider getting involved. Go ahead and email, email us if you have questions, comments, or ideas. And, consider joining us on Slack, and I think now we'll take some questions. Thank you for being on time, and now we have some questions. Hi, hi. all this consistency and workflow seems amazing, but I'm just thinking about, I imagine all the researchers will start to submit the data after the research is almost done, right? And they have pre-processed their data with their own pipelines. But after submitting, this raw data will go through your pre-processing pipeline, which I think would not be so much consistent with each researcher's pipeline, right? Later, how do you think that this inconsistency in terms of pre-processing will result in different I don't know, like, I find it a bit... So, I, right now, we're not collecting the, the publication-driven analysis results. And we'll need to figure out how to best compare between, you're right, the things, the, the analyses that go into these publications and how to bring everything, how we bring everything together in the atlas. The purpose of the standard pipelines is so the sorts of batch effects that have been discussed, there will still be experimental batch effects, but we don't have to correct so much for analysis batch effects. Yeah. Um, and, which is why that standard processing is being done. But you're right, we need, to, we need to work closely with the community to make sure the methods we're chosen are suitable 
and to understand the differences between a home-brewed pipeline and an individual one and actually help people use the pipelines we're doing, we're creating for their own. Yeah, that would be one way to kind of uh, encourage everyone to use your pipelines in their analysis. But uh, for now, at least, you said that it's limited to SmartSeq and 10x, right? And I think, for example, for 10x, everyone would, by default, go for Cell Ranger, right? And then you have your own 10x pipeline. I mean, like... Oh, this, is a ma this is a massive effort, and hopefully over, over the course of the next years, as we've heard from these other... The Analysis Working Group and the, the Common Coordinate Framework Working Group, it's all... It's important that we work together and, f and figure out the best, the best way forward here. I think you want to rebuttal that, or...? Uh, I, want to, I want to add some nuance to this. I think the, it is entirely true that today anyone uses, everyone uses their own pipeline and that's what they do because that's what they have available. I think our goal as a, a group is to find both the right incentives and the wherewithal together not to remain stuck in a situation where everyone does something separately and then later on tries to figure out how it combines. And it does require a shift. It's not going to be mandated by anyone. It's going to be partly the fact that we want it as a scientific community and partly that it would be incentivized. And I will highlight a couple of incentives. The first is people usually use pipelines simply because they exist. The reason people use the Cell Ranger pipeline is because it's there, it works, and so you use it. And, and, and as a result, having a great, robust approach that we find to be technically excellent would be a great incentive to people to use it. If you make something that's not great, then people won't use it, and rightfully so. The second reason is that I believe that increasingly people will not actually find their data as valuable unless they put it in the context of other data. You, you've seen today from the examples that Sarah highlighted that if today you're interested in the lung, you had better compare it to these you know, 750,000 cells that were already collected by about 13 labs across a, a multitude of individuals because why wouldn't you? And in that context, it would be a great incentive to actually analyze it all together within one unified approach, rather than first analyze yours and then try to match it to data that was analyzed by other people in other ways, which might amplify differences rather than similarities. And that relates also to the great challenge that Dana posed us around normalization. Great. Thank you. I think Katrina. Uh, thank you. It's always impressive to hear what you've been doing. I was wondering, how do you envisage non-expert users interacting with the DCP? And have you been user testing, or do you envisage user testing in the future with people who might not ever have heard of a Jupyter notebook, but probably will be really interested in, in, in aspects of the data? Yeah, I know that's, that's a really important audience, and we want to be able to reach out to them. Right now, we're at a sufficiently early stage that it's a bit challenging, but um, Gabby, who is one of our user ex um, experience experts who's here, would, uh, is very happy to talk to, to people who consider themselves non-expert users and figure out how best to, you know, what, what needs to be on our roadmap so we can support um, people using it, you know, even sort of biological domain experts who just don't know how to use command line tools all the way out to, you know, people who, citizen scientists who are just super interested. Thank you. Okay, let's thank the DCP team one more time. And again, there will be breakout sessions and speed dating sessions, so please join them and provide your feedback. So last presentation of this session, um, very important topic, is Ethics Working Group, uh, presented by Emily Kirby, Barbara Wald, Roderick Guigo, and Sharon Bowser, so please. Okay, so just to make sure that we have the full effect of the coffee break afterwards, we have a few minutes on ethics now. Um, we'll try to zip through it. <laughs> so my name is Emily Kirby, and I'll be presenting today on behalf of Bartha Knoppers, Rarik Bigo, and Barbara Wold, who are co-chairs of the Ethics Working Group. And I'll turn the second part of the conversation uh, to Sarian, who will present updates on the GDPR task force. So first I'll start by giving you a brief update of the recent activities of the Ethics Working Group, so the EWG, and then I'll point to some of the key topics we've been discussing, so ethics governance, tissue sampling and research consent, data sharing, and for each of these topics I'll point out key tools that we're working on to develop the HCA Ethics Toolkit. And finally, uh, as I mentioned, Sarian will then cover GDPR's task force updates, which touch upon privacy and data protection. And of course, all of this work, so the EDWG work, would not be possible without uh, support we're receiving from CZI, the Helmsley Trust, and the Carmen Family Foundation, as well as uh, funding for face-to-face -face workshops from the Wellcome Trust. 
So the ethics working group is actually quite a new group within the HGA. It was formed in September of 2018, and we've had about three uh, teleconferences since then. Uh, it's also a large group, so we have 16 members, several observers, three co-chairs. And I think interesting points of this group is that it is really quite international. So we have 12 countries represented within the membership of the EWG. And it's also cross-disciplinary in terms of ethics. So we have different people from different ethical expertise, but we also have technical experts from within the HGA, but also people who were originally external to the HGA are now giving their sort of point of view on ethics matters. So what is the role of the ethics working group? So it's really a twofold um, mandate. So first of all, we, of course, it's a group that discusses the ethical legal issues relevant to the HGA and particularly with respect to its global international reach. Um, and also a key point of this group is that it will provide input and comment on um, the governance, ethics governance documents that we're working on so that I, I'm naming the ethics toolkit throughout this talk. And um, so first, the, the major topic that we've been discussing within the EWG is ethics governance. So when I talk about governance, I mean the principles, the policies, the framework in place to um, build the foundational ethics principles applicable to the HGA. So when we're working on ethics governance issues, we really want to be mindful of you know, global equity, interoperability between jurisdictions. We want to make sure that when we're developing ethics tools, we encourage open science principles. And uh, as well as we're mindful of divergences in jurisdictional, local requirements, because of course, as many of you know, um, regulatory requirements are quite different in different countries. And finally, when we develop uh, framing principles, we want to provide guidance on a range of issues. Um, so there are many, many different topics that have ethical legal implications, such as tissue collection, procurement, uh, research ethics requirements, so do you have to submit to certain committees, data protection, data sharing, and IP, intellectual property. So, um, of course, when we are discussing uh, ethics governance, we're not starting from scratch, so different groups have already undertaken uh, you know, these aspects on an international sharing perspective. Uh, for example, if some of you may know, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health um, has developed standards, technical ethics, um, to foster international data sharing on a translational continuum and promote interoperability, so meaning that it can be used in different types of situations. And in particular of interest to us here is the GA4GH regulatory and ethics work stream, which has developed its own toolkit. Um, so these are really standard tools, policies that can be used by international data sharing projects uh, such as the HGA. So the HGA is a driver project of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which means that we're actually going to use some of these tools to develop the HGA ethics toolkit. So when I talk about this um, HGA ethics toolkit, so you'll see this slide a few times. Um, I've tried to map some of the tools we're developing along what I call a data trajectory here. So you have data contributors or generators, as um, they're also called. Then you have the HTTP data storage in the middle and data users on the access end of the spectrum. So in terms of ethics governance, the tools we're currently working on are to build an ethics and data governance document. Uh, so this will be a foundational document which will review some of the key um, governance principles I just talked about. And we'll also have a summary document, which is an ethics submission guidance document, which will be helpful to different um, HCA stakeholders in presenting what are the ethical underpinnings of uh, the, the project to ethics committees. So it's sort of a translation of technical principles in you know, ethics committees or uh, wider stakeholder um, language. Now, moving on to more specific issues we've looked at, um, the Ethics Working Group is looking also at tissue sampling and research consent. So to start this discussion, we worked on what we call a tissue provenance primer. So this is background research to help us develop tools. Uh, we looked at a high-level surveys of seven jurisdictions, and we looked at three different types of sampling scenarios. So we looked at post-mortem, uh, sampling from deceased donors, sampling of fetal embryonic tissues, and sampling of uh, tissues from live research participants and leftover clinical tissues. So for each of these, we looked at across seven jurisdictions 
what are different consent models, what are the ways that you obtain permission to use tissues and generate data and share this data as well. Um, so as you can imagine, just as it's technically difficult um, to have you know, samples from different tissue sources, ethically and from a regulatory perspective, also there's a lot of diversions. So now what we're trying to do is condense these three um, tissue sampling primers into one trans paper to make it very clear, to look at different types of models that have been used for consent or procurement into a trans paper, so it's a high level of summary. Now, um, of course, as I mentioned, the challenges that we have in terms of tissue sampling and research consent is that because there are a variety of different sampling sources, so deceased, living, commercial samples, legacy collections, embryonic, fetal, et cetera, pediatric as well, um, the regulatory and ethics context, context can change from situation to another. So um, it, it is quite challenging. Uh, there is also a challenge in terms of uh, having open science principles and detailing consent language that's appropriate for uh, very widespread sharing, so as open as possible. Um, so that being said, some of the tools that we're working on for tissue sampling and consent are listed right here, right here. And so we have a main consent document that will have um, high-level consent clauses wording that can be tailored for you know, projects collecting tissues. Uh, so maybe data generators, et cetera. Then we'll work on special consent clauses, addendums, which will be more specific for different sampling scenarios, so pediatrics, deceased. And finally, we'll have a consent filter tool, which will be useful to look at whether um, legacy data sets are suitable for inclusion in the HCA, and as well as an ethics and consent inventory that different projects can provide consents so that we can compare what's been done across the board and wording will be helpful for you know, tailoring project specific consent forms. And finally, the fourth point, of course, we've been looking at is data sharing, uh, both from a data co contribution or generation and a data access point of view. So uh, one of the key challenges in this area are the data access models. So we're looking at spectrums from open access, registered access to controlled access, depending on data sensitivity, et cetera. And of course, when we talk of different access models, um, we're also referring to data privacy regulatory requirements and open science, how these interact, new privacy regulations, and how can we align data sharing with these new expectations. And finally, um, there are some issues with uh, intellectual property um, restrictions or wordings that could limit um, certain types of you know, open sharing. So uh, hopefully we'll have some tools that will be helpful in wording um, to minimize certain restrictions. Uh, so again, from the ethics toolkit point of view, these are the tools, so mostly for from the upload and download point of view. So we will be working on uh, data contributor terms of use, so a template document that the DCP can tailor to its own needs. And we'll look at template material transfer agreements as well to make sure that wordings that uh, from where material has to be shared from one side of another, minimize restrictions um, from an ethical standpoint. Uh, privacy landscape points to consider, and a data access terms of use template, again, that can be used for accessing data um, from the DCP. So a key point really to take home from um, this discussion is, is that it's absolutely essential that we get input from the HCA community to make sure that our tools are useful um, to you know, a wide range of stakeholders, be it contributors, be it data users, the DCP, et cetera. So um, we're hoping to build a help desk uh, later this year to be a resource really for you, for the HCA community. Um, and it will be a platform that you can also submit questions to the ethics working group uh, for discussion by you know, our, our membership. Um, so with that, I would invite you to join us for the ethics roundtable session today, and we can have discussions on challenges, hurdles that the community has been having. So now I'll turn to Sarian, who will give us an update on GDPR. Thank you. Um, so I'm Sarian Bowers. I'm the head of policy at the Sanger Institute. I am really conscious that GDPR is all that's standing between you and coffee. Um, so I will try and make it quick. But I did want to explain a little bit about what GDPR is and its background and how it came into being, because it's quite relevant to some of the issues that um, HCA is experiencing and dealing with GDPR. So if you cast your mind back to 2012, this is when the Commission actually decided that they wanted to update the general data protection, uh, sorry, the data protection legislation for uh, citizens living in, or people living in the European economic area. 
Um, and I think the world actually looked quite different in 2012. I mean, we had Obama standing for re-election, and we had Mitt Romney and Newt Gingrich, Gingrich, I can't even say his name, Gingrich, slogging it out for the Republican candidacy. If you think about the elections that happened in 2016, the use of data in those elections was very different. We also had, um, we had Malala Yousafzai, um, who actually was shot in 2012. By the time GDPR actually became legislation, Malala had recovered, she'd done her GCSEs, she'd done her A-levels, and she'd gone to university, which tells you how long it took for this legislation to get through Parliament and become law. Um, and if the world looked different in 2012, so did genomics. Um, so back in 2012, uh, the University of Connecticut was so excited that someone spoke about genomics in its, at a symposium, they made it an entire headline. Uh, we had the gorilla genome. Subscribers to the National Hog Farmer uh, were delighted to find out that we've got the pig genome. Uh, Nanopore released its first sequencer. So that was, you know, when you think where they're at now. And we were 1,000 genomes was the really big project then. So 1,000 whole genomes. So this is what we're sort of contending with. Um, and this is what the world looked like when the Commission started thinking about data protection legislation. So what were they trying to do? Well, they already recognised the world had changed since the last time they'd written the legislation, which was in 95. They wanted to strengthen the rights of people living in the EEA and how their data was being used. The biggest change was actually they wanted to increase what's called transparency requirements. So organisations using personal data were basically required to say why they're using it, what they're using it for, um, and how data subjects can actually um, uh, have their rights maintained. And the idea was to try and harmonise it across Europe. So they were replacing a directive with a regulation, which is a, a legal di difference, but basically meant that the legislation should be identical in every country. Didn't really happen. Um, but I think this is really important, this one point, is that when the Commission were thinking about this legislation, they were primarily targeting insurance companies, marketing, all these kind of commercial uses of personal data. They weren't thinking about research, and so the good news is that they're not really trying to target research with this legislation. The bad news is, is that the sort of um, carve-outs for, re for research are kind of afterthoughts, which can make it a bit difficult. So that's all well and good, and the Commission proposed actually quite a reasonable piece of legislation, um, and the Parliament then had to uh, make some... They basically then had to take that legislation and propose amendments to it. And just as they were doing that, this guy, Edward Snowden, came along, uh, whistle blew on the NSA in the US, and the European Parliament kind of had a little freak out um, and got very scared and in initially proposed legislation that said that you had to get consent every single time you wanted to use someone's personal data. Um, and that didn't happen, because um, what actually happened was the Commission proposes the le legislation, the Parliament and the Council both propose amendments to the legislation, and then they go into this very European thing called a trilogue, where they slog it out and they come up with a compromise, which is what happened. But this thing about consent stuck in people's minds. They still think consent is really the be-all and end-all to do with GDPR. Um, so what does this have to do with HCA? Well, the first big thing was that in the definition of personal data in Article 4, for the very first time, they specifically mention genetic data. So for the first time, genetic data is, is personal data. Um, and in fact, because this was so novel, they wrote a, uh, what's called a recital, which is kind of a drafter's note um, in which they defined it a bit more. This is quite a legal definition of genetic data. Uh, probably doesn't quite match up with scientific views of genetic data. Um, and then the other thing that then came along was that you had to, um, they provided six different reasons, six different ways it could be legal to process personal data. So you basically need to have, be doing one of these six things in order for it to be legal to process data. If you're not, then you're, it's illegal to do it. So that left basically the HCA last year thinking, are we processing, is the DCP holding personal data? And if so, what do we need to do? So we put together the task force in November and we commissioned um, a law firm called Bird and Bird uh, to answer some questions that we set them about the, person, the data being held on the DCP and welcome very, very kindly funded all of this work. Um, so we asked a lot of questions actually, but the basic 
underlying thing was, is the data on the DCP actually personal data? Um, if it's personal data, that means it comes under GDPR. Who, is, um, who are the data controllers? So who are the people who are actually making the decisions about this data and therefore responsible for it? And then what is the lawful basis? So this is one of these six options that we have to be um, fulfilling in order to be able to process the data. Um, I won't actually, gonna, I'm not actually going to give you the answers to all of those questions, partly because those of us who had to sit through the discussion um, of what came back from them, it was seven hours, it took a long time. Um, but we made some recommendations to the OC based on what, what came out. Um, and so what we've suggested is that data from healthy deceased individuals, I realise healthy deceased is an oxymoron, but um, <laughs> so, in, so where we've taken healthy tissue from de deceased individuals, it is not covered by GDPR. Data potentially from, dise from diseased individuals, so potentially where there's a genetic disease there or it, something you can infer about relatives based on their genetics, or from living do donors will be pseudonymized on the DCP, but probably is not um, considered anonymized by GDPR. So therefore, we need to treat it as personal data. Um, HCA needs to streamline and minimize data controllership because at the moment it's probably the OC that are considered as data controllers and that's a lot of people trying to make a lot of decisions. So we need a simpler form of data controllership. We need to carry out a data protection impact assessment. This is basically understanding what's happening to the data, what the safeguards are and what are the risks to individuals. Um, and then we need some guidance on the interim management of data from living EEA citizens, which is currently um, underway. We will be going back to Bird and Bird for um, a second round of questions. So looking at um, options around how we can set up this data controllership, how can we make the management of the data or the decision making and the governance of the data simpler, um, that then impacts on actually where or which lawful basis we use. Um, and then we will also be asking a question about whether, um, it, whether the contributors should be using consent or not as their lawful basis. Um, so the next steps to the task force, which is not, the task force is not designed to um, keep going. It's supposed to have a, a finite end date. So we will make additional recommendations about the lawful basis. Um, and then we're going to share what we come up with as an executive and technical summary. And we will be sharing that with the research community um, and probably wider as well, because one of the really, really key things about this is this law is complicated. Um, and HCA is really the first consortia um, to tackle this problem and so there are a lot of people who are very very interested in what we're doing and also there's an opportunity for us as, an, as a consortia to really influence how um, various countries in the EU support science and um, how they interpret the data protection legislation. Um, I'm not going to go all the way through this but I think just I want to highlight this one point about consent that there are huge misconceptions um, about consent with GDPR and about the need for it under GDPR. Um, there's always a need, there's often a need for consent for other reasons, but not necessarily under GDPR. And actually the UK data protection authorities have actually said that researchers shouldn't be using consent as their lawful basis. So that's something to be thinking about if you're um, collecting data in the EU. Um, and with that, um, I just want to thank Katrina and James at Welcome, who have been amazingly supportive, and Emily and Mark at McGill, who have also really helped with this enormously complicated project. And with that, I'll let you get coffee. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe if there's one quick question for ethics. I know it's uh, Gay Aviv. Yes. Comment. Very quick. I want to add a particular thank you to Sarah. Saren already thanks Katrina in, in, in Mark and others, but I want to add a huge thank you to Saren and to um, Hank and to John Marioni because taking this on was not fun and is enormously important, not just for HCA, but because of what Saren said largely to the genomics community. And so I think we really owe them a debt of gratitude for that work. That's it. On that note, let's go for coffee. Um, we are going to provide 20 minutes of coffee break. So let's get back here at 11.40 and we'll start the session too. So thank you very much for all the speakers. Yeah.